All right, welcome to the Sweet Science of Fighting podcast. Today, we have Paul Green here. Welcome, Paul. I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, Matt. Ah, I appreciate it. And oh, you sp- I guess you specialize or you've put yourself in that uh, area of training older gentlemen and potentially ladies, the ones over 40 years of age. So mm-hmm. do you want to give a brief background about yourself, how you kind of got into that space? Um, it was, it's basically, I, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu myself. Um, uh, I'm a purple belt and as I've entered that space five or six years ago I'm noticing a lot of older men mm. especially in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu space definitely that, that just don't do anything and <laughs> I'm literally thinking like these guys have started to get their lives back they've discovered an amazingly powerful sport and which is great. All the all the benefits that come with martial arts, especially Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, for loads of crazy reasons we could probably talk about. But with with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu marketed as, you know, the, the the strong guy gets beat off the more technical guy. Mm. I thought maybe there's maybe maybe the culture of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu has led to strength training, effective strength training, and all the rest of it taking a little bit of a backseat on the priority list. And it's my belief that 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 is correct or loosely correct. And what you're seeing is a sport which is, you know, very highly technical, a very amazing sport. But there's a lot of men, especially the other old and crusty generation, the dinosaurs that <laughs> that don't, they're not inspired by strength training. They're not doing it and, and, and they're suffering for that. The bodies, the joints, absolutely everything that comes with that. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, if you just done some, if you just done some basic things, you would be in such better shape. Like I'm seeing people wearing knee straps, elbow straps. Yeah. Like you look at a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu athlete or a student, you know, a hobbyist. The amount of tape they've got on the fingers, <laughs> the amount of they're just they're just literally like walking mummies. Like you know, and they're struggling to walk down the street, struggling to like walk the dog, get out of bed, and I'm just like. It's great that you're doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but if you just added a little bit, a little bit of this in, you would be, you'd be such like so much better suited for the demands of the sport because it's yet a no impact sport, but there is a lot of demands that go through the joints, a lot of weird demands as well, especially you know just crazy directional forces that are going through the joints, and it adds up, and I want to keep you know men doing this amazingly powerful thing for as long as possible um and yeah it is men only sorry ladies <laughs> luckily i think I <laughs> my missus won't like... be happy with me working with many women <laughs> yeah i'm the same with you man it's uh well the thing is it's probably only three ladies listening to this i think i think if i check the demographics it's mainly dudes anyway sorry ladies but hey it's going to be applicable to you anyway if you are listening yeah um, too right. prin- principles span across sports demographics etc yeah. but Obviously, you talked about you know people coming in and not strength training, which is yeah, that's definitely definitely an issue. We will go down that road, but first, I would, are there any other I guess common mistakes that you see with older individuals coming into say any martial art combat sport uh, that may be neg- or we can say negatively affecting their body, their health, or things that they should be doing that a lot of people aren't doing. Well, what's what's amazing about this, and and you've probably seen it yourself, is. Um, different sports have different like f- like foundations and like like for example judo, they're the most some of the most powerful athletes you'll you'll ever see. The most you know they're like power they're like Olympic powerlifters with the gi on, so they clearly need to prioritize you know the powerlifting and all the rest of all the stuff that comes with power and speed training and stuff. Your wrestlers, you know, very highly conditioned athletes, mm. uh, you know, other sports. But for for two the two out two out of like the main three grappling arts, but then jujitsu doesn't prioritize this. But like you say, great question. There is definitely a lot of stuff that does get neglected as well. Because what I see is jujitsu is, is is something that is well it's welcome people in it's attract people are being attracted to it for whatever reason. And yeah, the the come in and it, it it's crazy because I say I say all the time I'm like some of the, some of these lads they're having a can of monster and three bags of crisps and they're absolutely <laughs> destroying everybody on the map. Who the frig am I, Mr. Science man talking about, <laughs> you know, longevity and sports performance when 
you know, like, the bad habits aren't punished in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as much on the mat because it's not highly demanding physically. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yep. So mm-hmm. they get away with it. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it creates, like, a really... It's, it's hard for me, put it this way, it's hard for me to try and, you know, sell this idea to them. But predominantly, there is all sorts of bad habits. Like, typical the typical health of somebody... That I think I think the culture's changing, you know. Um, I think pro- probably because of the top level of the sport and you know all the amount of steroids and the amount of pictures of like your top level yeah. athletes. I think people are like ah, he's strong, he's athletic. Maybe I should prioritize it. And I, and I do think that you know that the pace of the top level of these sports now, it's becoming more evident that you know your S and C is 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 is, is necessary. But um, with me, as much as I do like working with the, the, the highly tuned athlete, and especially with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you know, massive focus on like isometric training and stuff like that, I I prefer I prefer working with with the hobbyist, you know, in order to move the needle for 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 everything else off the mat as well. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Not for sure. So, now, say again. Now I was gonna say. I- uh, what what might be yeah. helpful and practical for a lot of people listening as well is people who may be doing some kind of strength training or thinking about it and they do whatever martial art they do and they want to add it to their routine. And obviously a lot of people might just search online, find something, and the program's probably not, it's probably potentially too advanced for their current athletic ability. Because a lot of people say over 40, maybe getting back into martial arts or doing martial arts, have probably spent 10, 20 plus years not doing a lot of things. Because you go from playing a lot of sport in your teenage years, running, jumping, sprinting, whatever it is, mm. then you get to your 20s, you may do a little bit, but then that starts to drop off. Maybe you found the gym, maybe whatever it is, and then you go in up 10, 20 years, and you don't jump, and you don't run, you don't sprint, you don't throw, you don't rotate, you kind of just power lift or just do the martial art. And then you go find a new program, and it's like, oh, you know, are you prepared to start doing sets of box jumps? And then are you also prepared to start doing heavier squats with it and a lot of volume or whatever it is? So do you want to maybe just give some advice on how someone could potentially navigate their way through that and then how they could, or what they should look for in a, maybe in a program to get started? Um, I always, so <laughs> a lot of people, like you are right in what you're saying, that there's, there's usually a big gap. You know, people have families, people have kids and demanding, mm. you know, work, life, all the rest of it. And what you did when you were younger, you know, it's in the back of your mind, but your training age has importance with, with regards to my programs, but it's not it's not your training age, it's it's how how long you've been out out of the game. For me, mm. that's that's what really influ- influences the programming. Um how I navigate it is I usually I usually start them off on a clean slate sort of thing. So I would I know what you're saying, like a lot of people will approach and go on YouTube top five exercises for jiu-jitsu strength and mm. and, and all of this that's and, good content you know, to, to get a lot of views by the way you should make yeah, those as well <laughs> yeah, yeah i just I, I've, I've you know i've moved away from instagram we could talk about that later on like I've, I've kind of like just shifted my focus a little bit to just purely pure education because mm-hmm. i can be the i can be the entertainer you know but i'm just like no i'm just gonna just gonna teach some people <laughs> some important shit but um the way i usually navigate it is I start it, you know. I start, I start a clean slate, um, and I just think that's the best way with with it because I'd love to, you know, do the power train, but I don't know what they've been doing. Like, if they've had a gap, yeah. most of the people that I'm working with have had a gap, and when they when they um, they'll do the test a test week with me, and it'll be, you know, my six six uh, movement patterns, and from from them from them videos, I'm like, okay. And then we'll we'll define the priorities. They'll come to me and say, "Look, I want weight management. I want to really improve my my guard or whatever, or I want to be able to do a body triangle." So, but I'll look at the lifts and I'll be like, "Look, they're great goals. I'm happy that you you know you've got goals and stuff. But let's let's just address these issues with your body. Like I seen your knee was coming in ridiculously when you were doing a zercher squat. We need to probably have a look at look at these, and then we'll start you on like a kind of a hypertrophy block with you know really good tempo. Just build a little bit of muscle, and then we'll go into the strength. Then we'll go into the power and speed. Um, but I do err on the on that just nice and simple. I was watching your video um, 
earlier on actually about um the the optimal training power oh, training yeah, optimal load. power load yep yeah um and yeah i i, I was cuz that that's that stuff's relevant for my like last block with you know my last power power speed block mm-hmm. and it was interesting what you're saying start with the fast stuff finish with the slow and heavy you know what i mean in in the training mm-hmm. sessions and i was like yeah so it's um it's an interesting battle but because they are over 40 and because my my fundamental goal is to keep them doing not necessarily optimizing performance it's just to literally fundamentally mm. keep them on the mat then once they have once they have built a base of you know strong joints then develop that into resilient joints then we can start looking at performance you can't you can't start looking at performance before these foundations have been set so they have to earn the right and they earn the right to train strength when they've you know done i don't know it's a kind of yeah typical program typical online coach you know trying to <laughs> keep me in the program a little bit longer i will progress them like i will move them on um faster um if if they if if they're ready but i'm not going to um allow like a you know like a bull in a china shop approach with 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 my with my guys because it, it they're at an age where it it, it they, you have to be a little bit more careful mm. um but the, the glory of it is is their development the development they go on is is ridiculous you know what i mean like yeah. in the gym we call it like newbie gains or whatever where you haven't trained for years and then you know and then the back into it the the gains that they get is just it's just absolutely insane on their lifts and and that's always amazing but more importantly their joint pain is is starting to go mm. away and their reoccurring elbow injury is starting to go away and, and you know what I mean then after all that after all that's addressed then we can you know start looking at performance so well, that is performance training you're saying it's not performance no, no, training but it is for, for people no. who are listening yeah. oh yeah of course no of course because because you're able to get them pain you know reduce pain yeah. so that they can perform better on the mats you know i think a lot of a lot of people or p- people who may be listening maybe you kind of see it as two distinct yeah i guess kind of training styles where i'm just training for health and longevity and quote-unquote injury prevention versus i'm training for performance but i think most, a lot of people need to i think it, a lot of people see it in a lot of things in isolation right no, that's that's a good that isolation that isolation uh, aerobic anaerobic strength power but everything blends together and everything mm. is towards kind of that one goal and it's just yeah depending on the person you're training obviously like with your guys there that's that's their performance training it's slower yeah. movements regaining strength regaining muscle and you know and they perform better and it's it's awesome it's especially with you know guys that are a little older and and they need that as you mentioned they need some of that base back because i know what were they doing what were they doing before but I actually wanted to ask a question on that. So when when would you start to introduce some kind of like low level jump plyometric throw to something out of the normal, maybe just standard uh, lifting exercises? Is that something that you bring in initially or you kind of build them up first a little bit through some of those first phases? So I, I would, I'd, I'd definitely <laughs> run a good, a good boring like hypertrophy block for probably about, probably about two months just to get some mm. foundations in there. And then I'd start to bring it in incrementally, but I'd look to add low level plyometrics into like the strength block, which would be the second main block. Um, yeah. And it'd be like low level agility, low level plyometrics, um, interval stuff. So I, my first block is, is aerobic. I was watching, I watched a little bit of um, your, your thoughts on aerobic as well. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it'd be hypertrophy and zone two yep. to start with. And then it progresses on to strength, a little bit of it, like intervals. I introduce yeah. agility um, and then low-level plyo. And then power power speed, you can get excited and make it like really sport-specific and stuff. So, yeah, it's it's cool, nice. man. So what, what, happens, what happens after the power speed block? Do you start back again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. So nice. just a big circle of frigging benefit <laughs> for these absolute legends. <laughs> making their second half of their life better than their first half no that's that's awesome yeah yeah it's always good to see once once older older athletes start to see the benefits of actually doing something in the gym because as you mentioned people come uh, man i don't know there's a, a shit ton of 
jujitsu athletes that just don't lift weights, which mm. is crazy, which is crazy to me. Like, I know. I you're know. trying to like, like grab other human beings that are like your weight or heavier, and then <laughs> and you don't want to you don't want to do any weights to help you. It's like, damn. and then once believe... they start, they go and they realize that the benefit. Yeah, I I, I cannot believe that like people just don't understand that if you are like you have an overall better level of strength then you, your body's going to be better suited to cope with the demands that you're putting it like on the mat like i i, just, I can't believe like coming from like a you know a physical training background and you know the things that i've done in, in, in the past decade or whatever to walk into a gym and i'm getting called the strong guy <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like you know nothing you know what i mean like i'm one of the weakest people i know do you know what i mean <laughs> it's like i'm the strong guy and i'm like no you're just weak as piss <laughs> you know what i mean like honestly the gym at work um have you heard of the royal military academy sandhurst no so it's it's a british um world like global leadership training academy for the military and uh there's like there was like 15, um, 15 of us there, coaches, and we'd run the military leadership training for all of these people that came from the world, and they'd do like a they'd do like an eight month course there, a leadership training oh. program, and then go back to their armies across the world, and then they would be like a, a young officer in their own armies. <laughs> like I was getting called the strong guy on the mats, and I was going <laughs> back to the gym nine till five, and I was one of the weakest there, like. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's the same as everything, but it's it's really interesting. I don't think I'm strong at all. I'm just I think a lot of them are unconditioned. Yes, they mm. do jujitsu and they can get away with it because the physical demands are, are kind of optional in a way. You don't need to stand up if you don't want. You don't need to try <laughs> if you don't. You know what I mean? You don't you don't need to try if you don't want. So, but when it's heat, the heat of the battle, you've potentially got a sixty year old man who's not trained in twenty years, having a bit of a war with someone that's twenty one year old. Mm. And the amount of stresses and directional forces that are going through the muscles, the joints, and he's this young lad might be strong as well. He might strength train, and it's just it's crazy to think that it's normal. And, <laughs> and another thing that pisses me off is that it's normal. A little injury, a little injury in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world is like a it's like a it's like a battle scar. It's like yeah, I've just injured my elbow, and it's like. Oh. <laughs> Like they wear them as like you know medals of honor, and I'm like, what is going on? Like it, yeah. And I'm like, oh, you can't just fucking go to the gym. Like I, you know, it's it's hard for me because when I'm saying to somebody, if you do one strength, like if you can only spare one session, one one session per week, if you can only spare, you know, ninety minutes per week for a full body like training session. Uh, you're like you're gonna have to take away you know a session on the map perhaps but it's gonna it's gonna make a difference like it's gonna it's gonna move the needle um and it's really hard because these martial arts not just brazilian jiu-jitsu these martial arts are so much fun and what happens is i was looking at i was i was messing about with chat gpt and i was (laughs) like and i was like i was really trying to nail down why why people are so into the rabbit hole of anyway i basically asked chat gpt i went what is um i basically laid out the situation in a paragraph and i said can you relate this to any of the seven deadly sins so and and you're probably thinking what the hell so I basically asked ChatGPT, like, look, people love the progression of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. They're addicted to it. The community, the um, the, you know, the the the, the socialized, you know, the banter, it, the the skill acquisition, the the touch of humans, the play fighting, the, the the you know, the confidence. That regularly, and I said, can you relate any of that? To, and anyway, ChatGPT comes back and says, greed. So the mind becomes greedy. Because it wants the skill acquisition, it wants the development, it wants the socialising, and you enter the rabbit hole so much that your your joints become fucked. Like you, you you've probably seen it yourself. Like you train martial arts for two or three weeks straight with no weights, you're, you're holding your elbow. You're like, oh, it's getting a bit sore. I need to probably do a do a do an upper body. You know, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. And it gets gets greed. Because you're addicted, yeah. and everybody says everybody says these martial arts are like 
drugs, you know, they are drugs for a lot of people, and especially men over 40 that have lived ball and chain with their with their wife, you know, <laughs> and they've got they've got be, they've been given a platform where it's just the ultimate hormones, and and as me saying, go and do some weights, count to ten, count to ten, <laughs> it's a hard sell. Put it, mate. Honestly, it's a hard sell. Oh, that's crack up. Do you want to <laughs> go into maybe let's do a, maybe an example training day or example just random program from each three of your blocks just to give people an idea of kind of what that program looks like for someone over forty and they can maybe relate to other programs I've seen if it's different or similar. Yeah. So my my, my most of my program has. Um, like six main movements. I really like um, a heels elevated squat because my athletes, um, my blokes, you know, are limited mobility. But mm. my research tells me that knees are the weaker one of the one of the weaker areas. So one of my ways of taking ankle mobility and hip mobility out of the game for these athletes is he- heels elevated squat. But I, I, I make it a zercher. Mm-hmm. So it's a Zercher heels elevated squat. So like an example session would be they would do hypertrophy rep ranges, eight to 12 repetitions, three reps, 10, um, like 80% of their 80% of their one RM. And they would do three seconds on the way down, one second pause, and then one second up. They'd have like 90 seconds rest in between sets. After that, they'd go into like, they're going like a superset, so it'd be like a reverse lunge into a single leg RDL. So mm-hmm. starting to get a little bit more technical, but still quite basic. And then after that, they would do like I don't know what. So that that'd be like a lower body session. Um, and sometimes I like to just finish it off with like really. I like I like goblet squats and stuff like that. So Zercher, a couple of single leg exercises in there. And then I just wrap it up really quickly. Um, I've done sessions with people where I, when I do like five or six exercise, like five exercises or four exercises, mm-hmm. they're really struggling. So yeah. volume, you know, when I'm when I'm thinking about training age and how recently they're trained, I need to be really careful with with the amount of volume that they're doing at the start of their program. But I just at the start, but then I have to be dynamic, you know, on on the, on the move, and like maybe three weeks in, I can change it. Because they've changed, there's just they can start to absorb weights normally. Mm. Then, because the last thing I want from a day one week one athlete is, oh my god, I was I was my legs were in bits for five or six days. Mm. So that that would be the first thing. It's just overcoming that, you know, the breaking down them barriers. But um, one thing that I notice, people use age as an excuse. Now, if I had a twenty one year old in the gym doing the same session, who's got zero training age. And a 55-year-old who's got zero training age, guaranteed they're both going to be sore. <laughs> yeah. but the only one the only one that's going to use age as an excuse is the 55-year-old. Mm-hmm. There, wouldn't be, <laughs> there, there wouldn't be much difference in muscle soreness. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They wouldn't mm-hmm. be. So, it's honestly, it's, it's, it's a struggle, but it's a good struggle. It's rewarding, you know, when... Um, and then, then anyway, then I progressed the strength. It'd be... You know, we're talking ninety percent similar movements, more rest. Um, you know, gotcha. you're talking your, th- your three minutes rest or rest till you you you're, you're actually ready to go again. Um, so we'd be talking about five, four to six reps. So I always like a little bit of flexibility in my um in my rep range. I don't just prescribe. You will do ten reps. So uh, block one, eight to twelve. Block two, four to six. You know, up the rest periods, and you're talking ninety ninety five percent one RM. Um, and it'd be similar movements again, but we're up in the weights. And as you say, these sessions that I can increase, I can add low level uh, plyometrics in towards the end. Start with the big muscles always. Finish with the smaller muscles. And power again. It just um, I'm trying. I'm trying to like be specific, but I'm actually skimming through it, being vague. <laughs> Am I like? Do you want me to be more specific, or do you yeah, want me sure. to just go? Go, yeah, right. So, yeah, a strength session would be because strength is the priority and I want the the working muscles to get frigging strong, I would probably dial back from the Zercher 
and I'd go mm-hmm. straight into the just a heels elevated squat. Mm-hmm. You know, safety bars in five by five or four, four to six for four sets. Ninety ninety percent of your one RM, and then I'd be go. I like I really like the the ATG split squat. Have you seen that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so instead, sometimes I put that in as well after the um, after instead of like a reverse lunge. Because one of my one of my priorities throughout the session throughout throughout the whole program is just to really get really get maximum range of motion at the weaker area, which is the knee for me. I was surprised. I thought grapplers would have, you know, really weak fingers and wrists and elbows because it's a grabbing art. But it, but actually, a lot of injuries are actually at the knee. More injuries are at the knee. I thought it'd be elbow, and but it's not. So. Back to that session, four to six, um, heels elevated squat, and that'd be their their main leg exercise. Yeah. On like session one, and really focusing on that, um, ATG split squat uh, to finish to finish that dumbbells really heavy, um, and then we push on to. I should have I should have if you told me get programs ready, I'd have it. Yeah. I'd have it all out. It's all good. <laughs> um, and uh, like. RDLs or a deadlift in there as well. So I'd have like let's say two compound movements, one unilateral, one unilateral movement, and then to finish it'd be like some jumps and stuff like that. Um, with the jumps, airing on the airing on like you know power side of it, but it'd just be like broad jumps, um, jump for six. So it'd be like starting to get them ready for the power block as well. Yeah. So, and then, but yeah, that that'd be strength. But again, I'd add, I'd add in the agility as well, some ta- on some sessions as well. But um, and then power and speed. I've never actually ran the power and speed block yet. So at the moment, I'm only I've only got people through the the strength the strength block. Yeah, it's funny enough once... you mentioned you mentioned the jumps and stuff at the end. That's something that I've I've talked about before as well, especially for older, more beat up people. Typically, uh, you mentioned before I talk about you go faster slow in exercises typically mm-hmm. in a session if you're playing like that but for if you're beat up and i do it sometimes as well is when you reverse that order it feels so good it feels mm-hmm. so damn good when you do your jumps and plies whatever at the end of the session after you've done your heavy weights if anyone has niggly knees and elbows whatever else that exercise order works but i like i like what you were saying with um on your video about about um you know, fast start fast. When the when the focus, because power and speed is all about intent. Mm-hmm. So when they come to the power speed block, the intent changes. Yeah. Instead of like you know producing maximal force with heavy load and moving slowly, do you know what I mean? They're not going to mm-hmm. be do, they're not going to be doing like your, your power cleans and stuff like that anymore because it's it's not quick enough. But mm-hmm. when they go to that, like it's interesting what you say because I was going to ask you. I was like. Do you prioritize the 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 light? You, well, you seem to think that you prioritize the light, the light and fast, as yeah. opposed to, as opposed to the, the the heavier. Do you know what I mean? It was interesting because I, I don't I don't know the answer to that, and I need to do my research on that. In, you mean in terms of maximizing speed and power? Yes. So would yeah. you you prefer to start on your light and fast exercise and finish with your heavy and slow? Yeah. Yeah. Typically, when, when, uh, yeah. Unless you're doing like complexes and whatever else, then it becomes it's, it's a whole different strategy. But if yeah. you're doing just a typical program, I like to go like your whatever your general warm up is, and then your plyometric jumps and and throws, um, and that will depend on you know are you doing weighted jumps etc. And kind of what order you you do that, or you don't even have to do it all. But it'll be like that kind of stuff, and then you might do some kind of loaded full body, so that might be an Olympic lift, it might be a loaded jump, whatever. And then into the heavier stuff, because so, then you're doing the you're doing the speed power stuff when you're fresh, right? Because that's yeah. the that's the main intent. Yeah. So when you when you layer it, so week one, like you were saying, ten percent one RM to start with, and then you finish with maybe your eighty percent front squats or whatever. When this, because obviously you've got this inversion of the of the force velocity curve. So mm. this is week one. You've got ten. Or let's say for two weeks, you're doing ten percent one RM speed work or even minus 10 percent. do you know yeah. what i mean at mm-hmm. the start of a block which nobody does by the way and it's, no. it's a great idea you know pure yeah pure great. velocity yeah cr- you know even more <laughs> velocity than, than possible <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's amazing that's an amazing idea and then but as the weeks go on and you start to like push the needle with both of those do you 
Um, do you... So, like, your minus 10 would then go to zero, so you'd go a body weight, and then it'd go to 10%. It might so not. You, start... you might stay there. Well, this is, depends, this, is, this, right? is what, this is what I was going to ask you. The start of the session would potentially progress in in, 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 in load, but then again, it depends on what they want, and it depends what you want for the, that athlete. Do you want yeah. to maintain is speed the priority or is power the yeah. priority? So but you'll go, the, you'll just change the volumes, right? Depending would you, on what would you would you would you not think this would be cool? So like, let's say for example, you're starting your you're doing your eighty percent lifts at the end of your session, mm. and the way you periodize it is, you let's say you're on ten percent one RM, but then it like does this. Do you know what I mean? So like at the end of your you get heavier at the start. So yeah. then, it, you know, the, the week two or the week three becomes 20% of your one RM yeah. for speed. But then at the end, it gets lighter. And then it, there's like that inversion happening within the session. I don't know. When when you were explaining that, I thought of that happening. I was like, well, if, if you know, week two, week three, you're making the, the, the 10% the um, body weight uh, speed mm. work, you're making that maybe 15% or 20%. Would the same happen... For no, the, for that the would end. stay or go. Oh, up. right, right, okay. And so, then you would, yeah, and then you would, you would just manipulate volumes based on what the goal is, right? So if yeah, if you if you're going through your strength block as an example, you might only do a few sets of the other stuff and do most of your volume at the top. Yeah, Fair. as an example, yeah, because uh, yeah, I think I, I think a lot of people get um, like on this kind of approach. I guess you could call it like a vertical integration approach where you kind of touch on most things in a session or at least everything within a training week. And pe people get, think I got to touch on everything and then everything becomes done at the same volume and everything progresses at the same time. And then that can become an issue in itself. It just kind of depends. There's so many variables. Like mm. <laughs> it's like so individual to whatever the sport or the person, like for yeah. your guys, like over 40, like you may only do a very small amount of volume of the speed stuff and you might do it at the end anyway, because do you, do you need to be completely fresh to do that stuff? And if they're completely fresh, aren't they sore? You know, maybe yeah. the lifting stuff. So the, the thing is with me that like <laughs> it needs to be trained, you know, power, speed and strength needs to be trained because type two B muscle fibers mm. are on the decline and they don't get addressed. And, yeah. and this is the thing. This is the whole reason I'm, I'm, I'm looking into this stuff. Um, so it does need to be trained. Um, and again, it builds like, speeds everybody you know all the gentlemen especially they just make that shift it's like oh i'm not young anymore endurance and i'm just like yeah dude i see this all the time now eh? it's like i guess the hybrid <laughs> athlete trend which hybrid athletes not you know everyone's a hybrid athlete hybrid athlete's just a trend but it's bodybuilding and marathon running i'm like fuck, like no speed no, no nothing it's just slow everything i was like damn <laughs> yeah i just like endurance is a, is a problem because you know muscular endurance impact it's just a recipe it is a recipe for disaster um especially as you get as you start to get older because the problem of spent stre low diminishing strength power and speed isn't getting addressed yeah and you know and i just need to beat the drum about don't be shy Maybe your starting point is a lot lower than than it maybe used to have been, but that's okay because it can it can it can happen, and there's there's nothing to say that you cannot train your strength, power, speed just because you're fifty or sixty year old. Yeah. Like it's, do you know what I mean? And, and if anything, the benefits are going to be greater than you've ever seen in your life, like because you've just not done it. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah, exactly, it's 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 so simple, but. Like I said earlier on, it's so hard for me to drag them away from a sport which they're so addicted to, mm -hmm. you know, in order to... Imp because I was talking about one of my mates. Um, I was talking about him, about this yesterday. And he was like, why would, why would you... Why would somebody jump on, one, jump on your program? And we were getting right down to it. And he was like, giving me, giving me it hard. And I was like, I was like, well, what's the alternative? I said, the alternative is... You know, shoulder surgery, fourteen grand. Um, you know, the, the alternative yeah. is this. He's like, he's like, dude. He's like, people do not give a fuck about that shit. If you said to somebody, if you do what you're doing today, tomorrow you will get, you will have a fourteen thousand dollar shoulder bill. You know what I mean? They'd be like, they'd still do the stupid thing, <laughs> like fitness and this type of stuff. S and C, 
for performance, it's different because you know your guys is you know it's different for you. And and when you're yeah. working with high performers, you know for upcoming competitions, they come to you, they're motivated, and I'm used to coaching them in in the army as well. Mm. Because people in front of me are highly motivated, you know, to develop their whatever for, you know, operations around the world. But trying to get men potentially unmotivated, it's hard enough to get them on the mats to then hmm. enter a new skill set because, you know, it's 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 tricky. But it's but it's a it's a very it's purposeful. And the way I see it developing because Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is my current main passion, I'm then going to venture out to like rock climbing, another one of my passions. And then it's going yeah. to be, you know, it's going to venture out to different hobby, basically keeping men over 40 doing their hobby and doing their, like their new mission, essentially. Um, whether that's playing, you know, guitar or whether that's whatever it might be, keeping men doing their thing. Um, but it's, it, I'm not going to lie this stuff. And you, you'll be the first person to, to agree with me. Like, it's a tricky old world, this um this online space. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. I know. Online is its own little beast. Do, do you have any uh, older guys who are competitors? Does your program change it change at all? Uh yeah. competitors yeah. as hobbyists? Yeah. So my um what one of the beautiful things about the grappling arts is they have masters. Um mm. you know what I mean? And, and and that is one of the most it's one of the biggest it's one of the most amazing setups ever. Like Boxing doesn't have masters, you know. Striking arts, I don't think have masters, but grappling has masters divisions. So if they say to me, "Look, I'm competing. I know I'm halfway through a hypertrophy block. Can we make some adjustments?" Can I? And I'm like, um, "I'm like, yeah, okay." And then generally, the the approach I like to take is I don't really get too specific with like movements and stuff like that because there's so many weird variables. But one thing that I do like to change up is the cardio. I'm a massive believer in, in similar to yourself, like zone two, right? We could have a conversation about zone two, but we need to move away from that now. If you're competing, you need to have it in your back pocket. You need to have it, the I call it cardio confidence. You need to have the confidence that if he come, if he's coming to war, if he's coming at you full send, that you mm. have the ability to, to problem solve at that high intensity. Um, if you don't have that in your arsenal, you're fucked. You know, you, you don't yeah. have the ability. So the main adjustment, like, like to answer your question, the main adjustment I make is the cardio. The cardio gets adjusted and ramped up. And the cardio I like to use is two hour run. I'm only joking. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's 10 hours of zone Road two. work, road work, road <laughs> work. No, it's, um, the gold standard for me is the assault bike. Mm-hmm. Are there so, any specific protocols you like to do on there for, for these gentlemen? Yeah, so I ask them. I say, how many um, how how many minutes are your rounds? So depending on their belt level, how many minutes are your rounds at the competition? They will say, oh, I'm doing, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a purple belt. I do five minutes rounds. And I'm like, cool. We need to get you ready for a five-minute round. So 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off on the assault bike for five minutes. So that... They would they would run that like that just that single session a few times a week, which mm -hmm. isn't that much. But then I yeah. ask them on week two or something, I'm like, how many matches if you were winning all your matches within that competition would you have? And he's like, well, there's currently eight people registered, so that'll be three matches. Okay, I need to get them ready for three matches at that intensity. So then. Do you see where I'm going? It progresses. Yep. So then it'll be a one and a one and a one singles added to the end of a, a, a hypertrophy session. And then on the second week, it might be a two two rounds, essentially, at the end of the session. Two rounds of five minutes to batter yep. on the assault bike. And a one and a one. And then the next week might be a two, two, two. And then, do you know what I mean? I just keep adding it on. So then when it comes down to it, they have got the confidence that they can go for absolute, like, serious pace yeah. And be able to recover. Um, I think that's just that for me is is it's so useful. Yeah. Um, because they know that whatever the other person brings, they're ready. And and I'm I'm a, I this is like a you know a bit controversial, but I believe that the assault bike is better for training cardio than hard sparring rounds. Mm. Because well, you can get more targeted, right, and more intensity. It, 
exactly. But there's how many people are in there So you know, how many people will agree that, or will, will disagree and go, no, there's nothing better than, than hard sparring rounds, you know, or, you know, I'm just like, you have to strategize, you have to problem solve, you have to pace yourself. There is no pacing yourself on an assault bike for 20 seconds. You yeah. are full send. Um, so that's my little secret thing that I just throw out there with them if they do need a competition, which is awesome for me because it's low impact. Yeah. It's not going to have a massively detrimental effect to their current training. So I'm still ticking all the boxes for the longevity piece and the joint strength and all the rest of it. But I am making the adjustment for their competition. Um, now, if they said to me, I'm competing in, um, you know, six months. I really would like to be able to do a body triangle comfortably. Then I could really start to, you know, work some elevated pigeon poses, you know, with, with dumbbells to really increase their, you know, external mm -hmm. rotation flexibility. And I could just put in like a little superpower if they wanted it. Um, but generally, it's just the cardio that gets adjusted because I... Without cardio, even if you don't, even if you don't use it, it you know it's just yeah, it's just knowing yeah. that if there is a scramble, like often I'm sure you've probably thought of it too. Like you don't do the you don't do the extra movement. You stop early and kind of accept a position because you know you're gassed. You know you're going to get gassed, and then you're like, I'll just stop here. Versus knowing that you can go that extra movement to win the position. Mm. It's it amazing stuff it's, like it's, that. It's, you know, like it's, it's such an amazing thing, and I'd rather spend the time there than, you know, doing, you know, some band work with single legs to do, to practice your takedown single leg or something, you know, oh, yeah. like <laughs> just, just do some hard shit on an assault bike. You will be, cause I know for a fact, the other person's not doing that. You know what I mean? The other person's yeah. not doing the assault bike sessions and I'm ready for three rounds on the assault bike to win this competition. And it's just, it's such a good thing because you just know you've got the cardio advantage over them. And yeah, you don't need to use it every time, but it is, yeah. That's that's the main adjustment I do for competitions. Nice. I've got a, I've got a couple of questions for you in the chat on YouTube here. So the first one is, what would be a good plyo slash speed? What would be good plyo slash speed exercises to keep and possibly build more fast twitch muscle fibers when you say when you are thirty five plus? Um, do you, do you want to answer that or is it, no, is it for me? That's for you. Good plyo um, speed exercises. Any maybe just general ones that you use. Okay, okay. So first thing with plyo speed exercises, or the word plyo, it gets thrown around the fitness industry um, quite it does loosely. A lot. <laughs> um, and and let's say back in the day when I was fifteen years ago and I was doing plyometrics, I was doing box jumps, and I was like, right, we're doing clap press ups and stuff like that. The word plyometrics refers to um, it is the direct exploitation of a fancy thing that happens in your body called the stretch shortening cycle. And it's actually very hard to do if, you, if you're not used to it. So mm, yeah. you, you're basically using the body's natural spring um, you know, and you're training it. And how you can train that is you, you basically have to limit the amount of contact that your body has on the floor. Sorry, your ground contact time. It has to be, you have to very, be very specific with how much contact. Because if you simply just do an, a, a jump where you, you, your feet are on the floor for five minutes and then you jump, <laughs> it's not actually true. Now there's another word. There's plyometrics <laughs> and then there's true plyometrics. <laughs> Why is there another, two, another word? Anyway, um, so you're basically exploiting your natural body spring. So depending on where you sit on the, on this level, it's going to be really, it's going to be, usually you start off really basic. It's like not many people, you'd be surprised, not many people can do actual plyometrics single leg. So you can... It, you it's, can it's actually hard. It is hard, especially really if you hard. haven't done it in a while. Yeah, I, I, I I, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'd, I'd basically, what I'd do straight away for plyometrics, I'd, I'd, just, I'd just like to highlight that plyometrics is a lot harder than people give it credit for. A lot of people do plyometrics and they're not actually doing plyometrics. They're doing explosive yeah. strength, which is great, by the way. I'm not disrespecting explosive strength. Your box jumps, you know, you're, you're getting a ball and slamming the ball really hard as fast as you can for like three to five reps and then doing like three to five reps of heavy kettlebell swings or something like that. Not arguing against all that, but plyometrics is your spring. For example, if you were to stand up now and you were to have very straight legs 
and you were to spring your feet, bang, 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 and you're basically thinking in your head, I'm a rabbit, I'm bouncing, mm-hmm. right? And, and you're basically trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to minimize the amount of time your foot has on the floor. It's like boing, 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 boing. And you're like popping up. It's quite hard to explain on, 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 on video. But, you know, if you give it a try and you actually feel like you're springing a little bit and you can really get some good height, that is you training your stretch shortening cycle. And, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of science in the way that um, you can only do a certain amount of reps per session before your body just starts failing with, with this type of stuff. But... Most people can do pogos, it's called. Pogos with, you know, the plyometric fundamentals in there. But then as you start to um, progress it, you can, I don't know, add, add like maybe a small step. And then you do exactly the same fundamentals that you've learned on the, um, on the, on the pogos. You do a small step. So you then do, is it called a deficit? Deficit. Like pogos. a drop jump, you mean? Yeah, drop jump. Sorry, you do you, you start progressing it into a drop jump, so you're getting the deceleration, and then the, 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 the you're getting the same pop. I like to call it a pop. It's like yeah. when your feet slap, bang! It, it like creates like a pop. I call sound. it an ankle pop. Ankle yeah, pop. yeah, yeah. It's like <clears throat> and um, yeah, you do a drop jump, and then you start progressing it that way, and then you'd have to really assess. You know, a few weeks time, you might be able to try single leg stuff, but um, there's there's the plyometrics overview. Um, for your the power stuff, like um, you know, James, a massive advocate of um, your power training. So you'd be in the gym, you'd be trying your power cleans and stuff like that. If that's too technical for you, you'd be ideally, you know, kettlebells. Um, you know, mm. ke- kettlebells. Maybe adding some resistance bands to the kettlebells as well to really increase the amount of like the balance of force through the kettlebell swing. You know, really low repetitions. You know, intent. So when you think about power training, think about intent, because when you start the set, it's all about, you know, that you create the signal of your brain is, is sparking the muscle. It has to come. You have to have that intent, like as soon as you walk into the gym. Um, so that's with the power training. Like it, it just think about intent. It doesn't always have to be, um, it doesn't always have to be heavy weight. It could be lightweight, but as long as that intent is there and a lot of people train power um, with really lot light weights and, you know, there's, there's 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 all sorts of stuff you can do, but the main thing is intent, and the main thing with plyometrics is be very be very um aware, you know, be very aware of your own yourself and your current ability levels because chances are you probably can't do plyometrics, um, uh, you know, extremely well. So bring it back down, try pogos, progress it onto drop jumps, and then yeah. That's about mm. it, really. But you, you've you probably got, you know, way more in the locker with regards to what I've just said. But, you know. I think I've got some I've got some videos on the YouTube channel, I think, there around <clears throat> progressing parametrics yeah. and all sorts of stuff, too. But it's a good point about the sport, the short ground contact times. A lot of people miss that up. Really short mm. ground contact times. So, yeah, as you mentioned, those pogos or ankle pops, jumping rope is pretty much the same thing. It's like jumping rope yeah. without a rope, essentially. Yeah. Uh, easiest way to explain it. Um there's also one more question as well from him. He's saying, do you have a benchmark uh, what per kg wise to maintain on the assault bike? Um, that's a great question. Um, I don't because it, it, it's going to be, um, it's going to be individual. So let's say for example, I've got a 60 year old lunatic on the <laughs> assault bike. My benchmark, you know, might be a certain wattage, like over 350 or something. So it's a good point you make because how do you maintain intensity? So I would advise, yes, is the answer to that question. You need to have your own individual wattage. However, I would simply have to ask them, I'd be like, what watts were you keeping there? And he's like, yeah, well, I started with 400 watts. Or, you know what I mean? And then I dropped it down to 200. I'm like, I'm not happy with that. So me personally, for my own personal personal sessions i am aiming to keep the intensity up because i know what you're saying like you can drop it and, and you start to become lazy it, but I'm, I'm i'm looking for the intent like the it's 20 seconds of you know i'm not too worried about it but it's it's something that i am i am trying i am monitoring um are you are you shift shifting the work intervals or rest intervals if you see a big drop like that like if you go from 400 watts to 200 watts are you are you changing anything um i i i don't do i don't do it i don't um i don't do it because 
I'm not too bothered about... I'm just, I'm, I'm, I have to be careful with my words here. Um, <laughs> I am looking for them to train their, you know, their cardio uh, to a ridiculously yeah. high level. If they're going, if they if their output is now halved, and they're still they're still you know in that zone five, and obviously then you could ask, am I tracking their zones? No, I'm not. But I do, I do, I, do, I would definitely advise do run in the session. And then check in when it drops off. And can you do a little bit more yeah. in order to it's keep it up? each week. Yeah. Each it, just, yeah. But like I say, my priority is to get them to be doing an assault bike session five minutes, similar to their rounds for their competition. Then add in another session on. So I'd give them like the five minute uh, session, the five minute round, five minutes rest, and they'd go back into it. I'm not too, the secondary bent, the secondary focus would be to, yeah, keep the watts high. But at the same time, I don't want to keep the watts high because then what if, what happens if they if you sit on that wattage when you could push way beyond that? Mm. Do you know what I mean? So like I'd rather you just put your head down. Honestly, you, you're not looking at the assault bike when you're going at these intensities. Your <laughs> yeah. eyes, your your eyes you are closed. <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't see. So like it's all about in your head. You're going for twenty seconds, ten seconds. Soon as you soon as the soon as the pedals have stopped, you're going again. Barely. Maybe once every couple of, like, maybe tw- twice or out of a set of eight or ten, do you actually look at the watts? And if you're looking at the watts, what are you not doing? You're not going fast enough. <laughs> yeah. And it's savage. It's savage of me to say that. But when you've done these sessions and you're competing and you're in the back of your head, you're thinking, I'm going to let you get tired before me because you know mm. there's no way, there's no way that's going to be the opposite. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's, nice. that's my attitude towards you know looking at wattage perfect i think that's everything i had i had for you paul where can people find and follow you and, and keep up with what you're doing so um i'm on instagram paul green bjj currently um on instagram and um on youtube i post daily um and i'm just posting educational content um specific to educating men over 40 and all the issues that they have and all the you know limiting beliefs that they have and you know hopefully i like to solve them solve as many of them issues on youtube as possible but um on the youtube it's paul green um academy i believe it is and you'll see a little picture of me with my army clothing there and (laughs) it's on the thumbnail too yeah so it's on the (laughs) thumbnail loads of green thumbnails and yeah i'm pretty dry with my my delivery but there's a few jokes a few laughs in there (laughs) <laughs> well, and I like to deliver them usually in like a lecture based format because, you know, I like to process that information myself and I'll have like a little lecture up and I talk through the lecture um, and just get just get straight to the point um, and, and try and move the needle, you know, through this wonderful digital world that we have access <laughs> to. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Perfect. I'll make sure that's linked up in the description too for anyone who wants. Thank you to very see much, you, Paul. Uh, who listened to the replay there? But I appreciate you coming on. No worries, mate. It was a great, uh, great to do it. You know, um, and obviously I keep checking your channel. You know, you got some good stuff, some great guests, and uh, I appreciate yeah. it. Cheers, mate. See you later.